Have you ever experienced a moment in your life that was so painful and confusing that all you wanted to do was learn as much as you could to make sense of it all? When I was 13, a close family friend, who's like an uncle to me, passed from pancreatic cancer. When the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers. And using the internet, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer. And what I had found shocked me. Over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. Why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? The reason our current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique. I mean, that's older than my dad. But also, it misses 30% of all pancreatic cancers and costs $800 per test. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. I knew there had to be a better way, so I went online and I saw what a test would really have to look like in order to effectively diagnose pancreatic cancer. A sensor would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. Now, there's a reason why we haven't updated a test for pancreatic cancer in over six decades. And that's because when we're looking for these cancers, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly for these um, varying amounts of protein in your bloodstream. And that sounds very straightforward, but it's anything but. Because you're essentially looking for this tiny amount of protein in this tiny difference, and that's pretty much like trying to find a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. However, undeterred, due to my teenage optimism, or ignorance, but <laughs> I went to Wikipedia, my go-to source for knowledge for any teenager, not the library, Wikipedia, a very reliable source. And I just went and I slowly found out a bunch of different information, and I went to Google, and then slowly I found this one article that was a database of over 8,000 different proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have pancreatic cancer. And so then I was just like, well, I have nothing better to do, so I just was like, I'll go through all 8,000. And on the 4,000th try, I finally found one protein that could diagnose pancreatic cancer effectively. The name of the protein was called mesothelin. Ooh, mesothelin. And it's just your ordinary run of the mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic ovarian and lung cancer, in which case it's found at these very high levels in your bloodstream. And then also the key is that it's found in the earliest stage of the disease, when you have close to 100% chance of survival. So now that I found a reliable protein to detect, I then shifted my focus to actually detecting that protein and thus the presence of pancreatic cancer. And my epiphany moment kind of came in the most unlikely of places, my high school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation in my opinion, <laughs> particularly with the biology teacher I had. And so I kind of smuggled in this article on what are called single-walled carbon nanotubes long, thin pipes of carbon that are an atom thick and one to 50,000th the diameter of your hair. So extremely small, but they have these incredible properties, kind of like the superheroes in material science. And so then I was also supposed to be paying attention to these things called antibodies, which are essentially like a lock and key. They only react with one specific protein, in this case, a cancer biomarker, mesothelium. And so I was just saying, kind of like smuggling in this article, like in my textbook, and then all of a sudden it came to me. What I was reading about and what I was supposed to be thinking about could be combined. Essentially, you take these antibodies and weave them into a network of nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts with one specific protein. But also, due to the amazing properties of nanotubes, it will change its electrical properties based on the amount of protein present, and thus indicate the presence of pancreatic cancer. And just as I had this epiphany, my biology teacher, I swear she has like eyes on the back of her head, she spots me and she's just like, oh, that Jackie and Draca, he's up to it again. And she storms up all red faced and just snatches that article out of my hands and is like, Mr. and Draca, what is this? I'm just like, oh, nothing. And she didn't really understand it either. But and then <laughs> after class, I finally go to her and beg her for my article back. And after this big lecture on self-respect and like listening to your teacher and shenanigans like that, finally get my article back. And that was really all I cared about for enduring that 30-minute long lecture. I'm not really into like listening to the teacher very often. And so then I went and started researching this idea, and I realized there was a bit of a catch to it. You see, these networks of nanotubes are extremely flimsy. And since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So that's why I chose to use paper. 
And making a cancer sensor made out of paper is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies. I mean, take some water, pour in some nanotubes, add antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. So then all of a sudden I realized, hey, I've done some pretty ridiculous things at my house. I mean, made like E. coli where we make sandwiches and chlorine gas in the basin, we're even on the FBI watch list. <laughs> but cancer research is a bit stretching the line. My mom wasn't really going to have that. So I had to find a lab. And me, knowing nothing, I once again kind of like went around and really just kind of cyber stalked like all these professors at Johns Hopkins. I was just like, ooh, where are your research interests? Pancreatic cancer, ooh. And then sent them an email. And I sent 200 emails to professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health. And I had this 31-page document that essentially spanned all the materials list, the procedure, and all of that. And I sent it out in this big mass email. And I sat back waiting for the positive emails to pour in. Then reality took hold. Over the course of that month, I got 199 rejections, spanning from ignoring me to saying, you're a kid, what are you talking about? You don't know cancer. And then also, oh, I'm too busy for that. And I realized one important thing. Professors aren't nearly as nice as their profile pictures make them look. <laughs> that was the key takeaway from this. And however, eventually I got one positive email saying, oh, maybe I, I'll, how about you come in for an interview? And three months later, I go into this guy's lab, Dr. Aaron by Maitra, go in armed with these giant stacks of articles. And then after an hour long interview, I finally got the position. And it wasn't really an interview, it was more of an interrogation. I mean, he like called in the 20 PhDs in the lab one by one, and they just sort of grilling me with these questions. And, it was pretty awful. I, was, I guessed on like all of them. I guess C as I do on all of my standardized tests. <laughs> and I got the position at the lab, and finally I could start doing some work. And just as soon as I sat down and started doing my little work, I realized that I had no clue what I was doing. And soon I had exploded a bunch of cells in a centrifuge and had to start all over. And now, like after seven months of hard work, I plugged millions of holes in my procedure, and I ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. It's 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of pancreatic cancer diagnostics. But also, it's 100% accurate so far, and can detect a cancer in the very earliest stage, when something has close to 100% chance of survival. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the pancreatic cancer survival rate from a dismal 5.5% to close to 100%, and would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. By switching out that antibody, you can potentially detect any protein, meaning any disease in the world, ranging from Alzheimer's to other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. And so through this, I've learned some very important lessons. And I've realized that there are really two main things that are preventing us from kind of having an innovation revolution. The first of which is lack of access to information. You see, over two billion people don't have access to the internet, meaning they don't have access to all the knowledge in the world. I mean, with the internet, it empowers you to really improve your condition, and it allows us to transcend this delicate fragmentation of nations and emerge as one united human race to solve all the problems of the world. However, when you don't have the internet, you can't really do much. I mean, you have to go to the library then, then usually most of the books there are outdated, and sometimes you're not even allowed in the library if you're a kid, and then all of a sudden you realize, well, that book isn't even there, and then sometimes they just don't even have books on that. So there's really big problems with not having the internet. So that's the first thing with lack of access. The second of which is there's these things called paywalls. And paywalls are really awful things, I realized, through this entire experience. What a paywall is is essentially when you want access to a certain article, you have to pay $31. And one of the big problems also is that once you pay that $31, then what if it doesn't have anything to do with your research? Then you're just $31 out. You can't like, return it and be like, oh, please take this article back. No, you're just $31 out. And then you're just like, oh, darn. 
And also, a really big problem is 50% of the best scientific articles are locked behind these paywalls. And so, for example, I'm a teenager. I'm 15. I don't have a lot of money. I mean, I'm on my mom's budget. And so I can really shell out the big dollars to get all these articles. And some of the subscriptions run up into like the 10,000s, like $40,000 per like subscription. And these have been so cost prohibitive that Harvard University has issued a statement saying, well, we just can't afford these anymore. So we're going to have to cut back. And when the wealthiest institution in the world, academic institution in the world, can't afford to pay its um, scientific publications, then how can you expect a 15-year-old to pay them? I mean, what does it say about the flow of information and the restriction and like this really outdated method of distribution of technology? I mean, like the dissemination of scientific knowledge means to be free. I mean, we all benefit when scientific knowledge is free and unrestricted. But really, these publishing companies don't really care about that anymore. They really care about making a profit now. I mean, they have 30% profit margins. And so far, each year, some of these publications have increased their prices by 167%. I mean, that's ridiculous. And so that's one of the big problems, is being able to get rid of these paywalls. And so they've really commoditized the scientific knowledge. And now what we're going to have to do also is there's a second problem that's preventing us from having this innovation revolution. And that's that kids like me were kind of ignored. I mean, when was the last time you've been called childish? A lot of adults aren't called that. that that's kind of an everyday occurrence to me. That was a lot of reason that a lot of my ideas got rejected. In fact, that was a common problem among all the Intel ISAF people, that they just got rejected because, oh, you're a teenager. You have no clue what you're doing. And we really have to begin to get rid of this age discriminatory uh, fact like, oh, you're childish, you're under 18, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, teenagers have gotten a really bad rap in like the past few centuries or so. We've kind of become a scapegoat for bad stuff. We've kind of become like the communists now. And <laughs> so we're going to have to kind of shift from, oh, those teenagers, if you have a black hoodie and scales, then you're up to no good. We're going to have to shift that to really being able to include people, to realize that an innovator can be an innovator no matter how small they are. And so we're really going to have to shift towards that because we're the internet age. I mean, y'all are a bit old. We have the internet for the past few years. So <laughs> yeah, take a few hints from us. And because really through the internet, anything is possible. Theories can be shared and it doesn't matter how old you are. You just have to have a great idea. And so we're really going to have to progress towards that in the next few years in order to solve the global problems of the world. And I believe that we can do that. Because imagine if a 15-year-old who didn't know what pancreas was could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer. Just imagine what you could do. Thank you.